And there is no mention of any charges or sections, what he is going to charge with. Once the police completed their investigations, then they formally charged the suspect with the relevant offenses. And there is no mention of any brief summary of the case in the charge sheet. But over here in Pakistan, when FIR is being registered, there is a case summary, the bottom of it, on the top is the sections that he's going to be charged with. In the UK, once the investigation is completed, a person is being charged, then the police submit the formal charge sheet and they gave the summary of the case in court on first appearance. But, uh, most of the people here are confused as uh, if I give a reference like the most hot case in Pakistan was Ayan Ali. She was arrested while taking the money out of the country and then it was about 100,000 or whatever the money was, and she was charged straight away and she was taken to the court. But, and the same people, they say why it's not happening in UK as well, where MQM leader was arrested, and he's not been charged yet. It's been over two years now. But if, if I take the same case, Ayana Lee, I mean, in UK practice, so they wouldn't have charged Ayana Lee straight away. They would have arrested her and then investigated. They want to see the full trail of the money. It's not only that money involved, but what was in her possession at the time. They would have searched her premises, her office premises, or anything linked to her. And then they formally charge it. Not for only that money that was seized from her in person. And that investigation take in a serious cases or a big cases, it can go up to two years, three years. <coughs> Currently, I have one of the cases which is not like this MQM one. It's a different one. It's a Pakistani solicitor. She was arrested in, in UK. And the investigation is going on for the last two years. And she's on the police bail. There's no political stuff involved in that. She's still st subject to the investigation, and it's been two years. What's the alleged offense? What is the alleged of uh, offense? Offenses. It's a f uh, for for the for the <coughs> It's a conspiracy to defraud the mortgage lenders. It's again the fraud matter. It's again the money matter as well. So it's a it's a mortgage fraud and where the money is involved. It's exactly, I would say, if it's not the money laundering, but it's similar to that one. And it's taken two years up to now. She's currently on police bail. I, I am dealing with the case. And I had the opportunity to deal with one of the UK's, the biggest case of the history regarding human trafficking, where the prosecution evidence was about 145,000 pages. That case investigation, before the suspects were charged, there was about two and a half years. And then the suspects were charged. Once the investigation is completed, then they take the case to the court. Every case, single case, whether it's the murder, whether it's money laundering, or whether it's a small case, it has to go to the magistrate. The beauty of the procedure is that on the first <coughs> appearance, if it's a summary only, which we say the summary, if it's the magistrate court triable only, and we call it summary, and if it's the Crown Court matter, and we say it's indictable only. If the matter is can be tried either in the magistrate court or the Crown Court, we say it's either way offence. If it's a summary only on the first appearance, everything should be dealt with. The prosecution has to serve 
the full set of the papers, including the statements of their witnesses. Defense should read the statements there and then and take the instructions from their client and raise any issue if they have regarding the defense. And they have to notify the court and the prosecution what their defenses are and what their witnesses' requirements are, whether they require any witness from the prosecution or not, or they can agree to the statements. And the same procedure then defense has to follow that they should notify the prosecution and the court that they have a one defense witness or the two defense witness. That has to be dealt on the very first hearing. Once that's been dealt with and the court will set the trial date, there is no excuse for anybody the trial should be adjourned. And whether it's a one hour trial or two hours trial or a one day trial or two days trial, the court will be allocated for that trial and the court will not take a leave until the case is finished. There is no way the prosecution do their statements today and then they will ask for a judgment and then it's go for another month or two months or three months. No. Once the court sits, they have to finish the case and then go for the next cases. If it's the Crown Court matter, the Magistrate Court will send straight away on the first hearing to the Crown Court. On the first appearances, the one-off, the thing is the bail matter, if the, uh, if the suspect is in a custody. If he's already on bail, so the bail will continue. If he's in custody, then the bail issue, which I think is very important as well to go through a little bit about the bail. In the UK, the first thing the judge will look and the court will look whether the suspect is a regular offender? Has he committed the crime in the past? If he has committed the crime in the past, thus becomes relevant to the bail application. <coughs> the next thing they look, whether the suspect in the past has committed the offense whilst he was on the bail. If he has committed the offense whilst he was on the bail, his bail automatically be refused because he's not a trustable person. If he's granted a bail again today, he will commit the offense again. If he has breached any of the bail condition in the past, he's most likely to breach the bail conditions again if he's trusted again to grant a bail. And how the court will know that he has committed the offences in the past and what's his previous history? It's the police responsibility to submit the full report, which we say is the PNC, is the Police National Computers. Everybody who's been arrested in the UK, their fingerprints, their DNA will be taken. The next time if he is arrested, he just need to put the finger on it, his full history will come up. <coughs> including all the cases against him, including all his previous history, including how many times he was convicted in the past, or how many offenses he committed in the past. And the court will see from there, and then they will look the bail matters. If a person is going to plead guilty on the first appearance, he will be given a full credit, we say in the UK. The full credit mean is the sentence he's going to have a 
following the trial, he will have the 33% discount on the sentence. This is the incentive to the suspect. If he pleads guilty today, for example, he's going to have a six-month custodial sentence after the conclusion of the trial. So today he will have four months. In all offenses? In all offenses. Every offense he pleads guilty, he will get 33% discount. If he's going to plead on the first appearance. Another thing is, which is very relevant to the sentence, we have in the UK is the probation. If the matter is so serious and the, gentle, and the suspect is going to have the custodial sentence and the court usually order a pre-sentence report where the probation officer will look the, at the suspect and his previous history and take all the, his circumstances into account and then prepare a report. That report will be submitted before the court on a sentencing date. <coughs> and that's where the advocacy also kicked in. Because it's not automatically the judge going to give the sentence when somebody is plead, has pleaded guilty or convicted. The judge wants to listen to the mitigation on his behalf from the defense. What sentence should he get? And there is a sentencing guideline available for these offenses as well, all offenses. And it's the duty of the defense lawyer to put all the mitigation circumstances before the judge and then ask the judge that my client falls within this category and this was the nature of it, the nature of the offense. He should be given this kind of sentence. It's not automatically what judge think or what everybody think, what the prosecution think. So it's a good art of advocacy there. And if the matter is going to be sent to the Crown Court, which is the higher court, like here is the session court, and then on the first appearance in the Crown Court, the timetable is being set. On what date the defense should submit def their defense case statement, the issues they're going to raise for the defense. And on what dates the prosecution serve all the documents on the defense in order to prepare their defense. <coughs> And then the trial date. The usually the matters that goes to the Crown Court, they are a bit higher. And the trials can last four weeks, day-to-day -day hearings, can last six months, day-to-day -day hearing. We have a few trials. I just had the trial uh, before coming to Pakistan. It was the people that were sending um, to Syria, which is a hot topic nowadays for terrorism stuff. And uh, we finished that case about in six weeks in a Crown Court. It was a day-to-day -day hearing. And in terms of, as we were talking about coming back to the bail, here in the UK, if the bail is being refused, you can go to the High Court, you can go to the Supreme Court. But in the UK, that's not the case. You have only two chances of the bail application. If it's refused, it's refused. Then you have to wait for the trial and the outcome of the trials. Unless there is a change of circumstances. When we say that there is a change of circumstances, what, what does it mean is if the prosecution has the prosecution has alleged somebody with something, and then when they serve the documents and it's not being shown on, the, on the, those documents, what they have alleged for, and then you can go for the second bail application. Otherwise, there is no way. And in terms of uh, uh, money offenses, where the, a lot of money is involved, uh, like um, uh, uh, MQM 
you can say now it's a hot topic in Pakistan and the people might want to hear about it. And people are confused at this stage because it's two different sets of cases. One is the murder and one is the money laundering. And the two separate prosecutions would be for each case. When we're coming back to the money laundering, there's going to be two cases in money laundering, not only one. One is the civil side, which we say the POCA matter, which is the Proceeds of Crime Act. And the money they have laundered to the UK, the total amount, the total benefit figure, the British authorities can ask for that. That will follow once the criminal matter is concluded, which is the money laundering. And the second POCA matter, which is pending at the court at the moment, which, which relates to the money that was seized at the time when they raided the houses and the offices, which the police has gone to the court, that's the case is pending in the court, where the, some leaders, they say, the judge asks this and the judge asks this. There's no other cases you can say in the courts except in relation to the money that was seized from the office and the house. Because the police duty is within the 24 hours, they should go before the magistrate court and get the order for the cash seizure for the detention of the money for the next six months. That usually the judges, they grant six months. And then after the six months, the police has to go back to the court. Look, we have not completed our in investigations, and therefore we need another six months. And that's, I think, they were referring to the media, which is completely something different. It's not the way it's been presented before the media. And uh, a lot of people, they say, uh, the political interest. I accept that to some extent. Because uh, recently we uh, dealt with uh, the biggest case in the UK as well. It was a uh, money laundering. Uh, the reason I'm going to refer that case is, uh, is similar to what's MQM cases. He, the gentleman, his name is uh, James Aburi, he was uh, Delta State Governor. He was in the UK in 1991. He was arrested in the UK for a theft matter. He was working for weeks there as a security guard. Then he moved back to Nigeria and then he got the offices of uh, the Governor in 1999. He completed first tenure for four years and the next tenure for four years again. Within that eight years period, he stole the money from a Nigerian oil rich state, which is Delta, and laundered the money to the UK and other countries and bought some properties in the UK. In 2000, 2007, once he finished the second governorship, he was threatened to the government that he was going to run the second presidential. Uh, I mean, against good luck Jonathan, who was the current president for Nigeria. <coughs> During his period, James Aburi, eight year period, he kicked out the British uh, oil companies. He did not give any contract to the British oil companies. And he went, on, uh, he went on to give the contracts to the French companies. Once, once he announced that he's going to run for presidential election, <coughs> Good luck, Jonathan, then asked the British authorities. I tried this gentleman to be tried in the Nigeria, but unfortunately, when we went to arrest him, there was a mob of people that came through, and then he fled the country. So he escaped from Nigeria. He sought shelter in Dubai. Okay, he asked the British authority. British authorities then said, okay, yeah, money launderer would done in Nigeria, but it was brought into UK, and we can do something for it. And then the cases were registered for conspiracy to defraud the Delta state in the UK. And the James Aburi was arrested in Dubai. 
and was extradited to UK. He was tried in the UK and he pleaded guilty because of the overwhelming evidence. So he tried to get the lenient sentence, the 33% discount, so he can run the next presidential election in Nigeria once his sentence is finished. But the matter fi not finished there. Because after his convictions, the next matter was the POCA, the pursuits of crime, the money he laundered to the UK that should be recovered of him, which the British authorities now estimates is about 250 million pounds. The assets they recovered from him, they have, and uh, he has in the UK currently, that are worth about only 10 million. So the rest of the 200 fill, 240 million, they are requesting of him. So he should get that 240 million, the total benefit figure. This is how the British authorities work in terms of the criminal proceedings and the trials and, and this money laundering offences. And uh, as I was coming uh, to Pakistan and then before coming to here, there was FIR was registered here in Pakistan as well uh, for a murder case. And the people then start asking about the extradition stuff. But one thing is very clear, the British authorities will not extradite any person to any country, even they have the treaty signed with that country, unless the criminal proceedings is over in the UK and the trial is concluded. If somebody is charged, the trial is included and it's not only the trial is included, if he's convicted, he should complete and is served full sentence in the UK, then he can be extradited to any other country. There was a case, uh, it's a uh, Divani case in the UK was a hot topic and the person was extradited to South Africa because he took his girlfriend to South Africa, not girlfriend, wife to South Africa. She was assassinated in South Africa while he was there and he was alleged that he paid somebody money there and he got insurance before travelling to South Africa so he can claim the insurance money back in the, back in the UK once his wife is died and uh, uh, killed in uh, South Africa. Then they found out, no, it was him who planned everything and then the South African authorities asked for extradition. And the issue of his health was risen in the UK. He got some mental health issues, he's a British national, he cannot be extradited to South Africa. But finally, he was extradited and he's facing trial in South Africa. Uh, I think I tried to cover everything briefly, so, and uh, I welcome any questions, if somebody has any questions. Uh, sir, uh, uh, one question actually, when you were talking about bail, uh, is bail a matter of course actually, unless there is a reason not to uh, grant it in, in the United Kingdom, regardless of the nature of the offence? No, I can understand. If it's a serious offence, like a murder or the other case, which are very serious. <coughs> and uh, it's not only the matter of the court. If a prosecution, the first thing is the prosecution, whether they have any objections to the bail. And their objections should be supported with the evidence. It's not only like a blind argument blind arguments in the court, oh, this person should be refused a bail, he has committed a, such a serious offence. But that's not the case. If he has a previous history, then his bail is difficult. If he doesn't have the previous history, his bail is a bit easy to be granted. But, coming back to your question, as here in, the, uh, in Pakistan recently you have Ayan Ali, cash was seized, and she was in custody, and the officer who stopped her with the cash was killed. Even though he was killed and the courts here in Pakistan granted the bail, but if 
the same case was in the UK, I can tell you for sure the bail would have been refused on the basis once the suspect is in the custody, the witnesses in the matter being killed. If the suspect is being granted a bail, what she can do while she is outside the custody? So that's the big question mark. So therefore, the bail should be refused. Uh, please. Uh, my question is if the, whether the MI6 has any influence on British legal or criminal system. Second, I do know my question regarding about Altaf uh, and according to Pakistan media that Altaf Hussain is the guest of MI6. So nobody can do anything against him. Second part, as FIR has been registered against three people in Islamabad, which are involved in the murder of Imran Haru, what will be the implications or respect of this FIR in UK? Yeah, first coming to the FIR, as I touched the FIR, FIR uh, uh, in my earlier lecture, but to my understanding, it's just a political stunt at the moment because he cannot be extradited unless he is subject to the. He currently he is subject to the prosecution in the UK. So that FIR is meaningless to me. So unless his prosecution in the UK is over. Coming back to your my my sixth question. As I touched earlier on James Abuji's case, I think that's given you the enlightenment. If the British authorities in trust is being overruled and they can go any further. If they have some interest, that's a different matter. But that's very rare. That's very rare. Any questions? Please. We were being told that uh, if a person appeared before the court and pleads guilty on the first date of appearance, he would be given 33% waiver in the total punishment provided under the effective law. But again, you said that the defense would be asked by the concerned court to apprise the court about the punishment that should be granted to the uh, concerned subject person. So my question is, that 33% would be on the quantum of punishment that would be decided after taking into account as the defense version, or it would be on the 33% uh, waiver would be on the total punishment provided in the statute. No. Uh, statue, for example, if I can give you this uh, very simple example, the maximum sentence is six months for offence the per suspect was being charged, and the 33 with the 33 percent discounts, he will he should get four months. But if you look into the circumstances of the person, there is a sent sentencing guideline available as well. It could be the case he should not get four months either. He can get only fine and get away with the with offence. Uh, please. Where's the sir? Your lecture is uh, full of information, and we are highly inspired and impressed, especially your English accent. And uh, more glad to know that you are from our ranks and fights, and you started your practice here, and then you went to UK. So, my question is for the, the youngsters and uh, even the mid carriers doing legal practice in Pakistan. What sort of scope are doing actors they have in the UK? And if somebody is interested, what steps uh, is uh, what steps are required to meet the criteria in UK? So, so you, your question is uh, that's if they want to start the practice in the UK, yes. that's correct. The first thing is because in the past it was a different, little bit different uh, procedure. The first thing, everybody who wants to go to the UK, uh, they have to face the immigration um, stuff. But nowadays, uh, the lot of immigration rules that's been changed now. Uh, if I in the UK, what they say is that immigration rules are being changed in the same way as the women change their boyfriends in the UK. <laughs> so this is one of those things. Overnight, there's so many uh, 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 changes that comes up uh, in immigration law. And then in terms of if somebody wants to uh, go to UK for um, uh, practice, especially, 
he has to, I think, uh, the better position is for him. He should get for uh, uh, get a student visa to study in the UK first. And then he has to do the conversion course, which it has been changed now, I think, QLTS now. QLTS, okay. Yeah. And uh, for a solicitor uh, practice, and uh, for a bar practice is a bit uh, different. And uh, he should get, uh, I think it's an English course now, I think 6.5 IELTS, uh, anybody who wants to qualify. And uh, they can accept one year experience from overseas, but it has to do the one year in the UK. as a two year experience before you qualify as a lawyer there. And uh, then the second thing will, be a, a for the gentleman that he should get the immigration status to practice in the UK, which uh, I think uh, nowadays uh, they have changed into the business visa stuff. Uh, that's the easiest way for anybody who wants to come over the UK and set up their practices. Uh, sir, uh, one follow-up. Uh Detailed information about all of these processes. Uh, if you go, we've already had seminars at the High Court. Further, edu High Court Bar, which further education and career improvement committee has already QLTTS kya hota hai, how barristers, solicitors ka kya silsla hai. All of that information was recorded and is available on Facebook. Actually, Lahore High Court Bar Association ka jo further education page hai. You can get all of that information in detail. Two uh, seminars are Arshad Awan Sahib and Barristers and uh, Solicitors. Dono ko humne tha. You can actually get that information from there as well. Sir. Sir. Any other questions, please? My question is, uh, what is the legal position regarding the UK Immigration Act? Uh, because there are questions about the jurisdiction matter in respect of arrest of a suspect if he is involved in money laundering cases like this. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of the jurisdiction, for example, uh, as I touched earlier on James Aburi, the money was laundered from uh, Nigeria and uh, Delta State and was taken to the UK. That's where the UK authorities get involved because the money that was laundered in the, from Nigeria but it was taken to UK and the property was bought in the UK, that's number one. And number two, the one of the person was present in the UK and the other was in, uh, in the South Africa or any other country, they can be tried for the conspiracy matter. Sir, uh, my fault, um, uh, you mentioned actually about 33% discount. No 33% discount in poker cases actually because you're saying a uh, yes. because in Pakistan you have plea, plea bargain. A voluntary return, you have to return 100% right at the outset, but in plea bargain in NAP cases, for example, you, you only have to pay a portion of it just, just for appealing yes. guilty. Yeah, in poker matter, but there is a, not a discount, but what you can do is when you're going to plead guilty, for example, you've been accused for 100 million and you see there is the prosecution court only approved for 10 million. And then it's better for you, you can put in your uh, basis of plea that I plead guilty for the 10 million. Then the poker would be restricted to 10 million. Otherwise, if you, if you found guilty, the prosecution will still go against you for 100 million. And it's most likely the court will grant 100 million against you if you got convicted. But before went to the trial on poker matters, it's a still matter for the defense to prove and make a representation. This is what our client was benefited from the total figure, and this is what the assets, the recoverable assets are with him, and our client is willing to offer a such and such amount. This is his benefit figure, and the prosecution most likely in some cases agreed to that. Like, I, I dealt with a case, um, as I referred earlier on, the one of the UK's the biggest case uh, for human trafficking, where the authorities asked for a 3.5 million, the total benefit figure. And we pleaded guilty uh, to the 35 uh, mm, uh, subjects that we smuggled to the UK. And the total benefit, of, uh, benefit figure for that amount, of uh, that subjects were about 240,000 pounds. And we restricted the poker for 240,000 pounds, even though there was a total benefit figure was 3.5 million. Yeah, Pakistan and UK have been in the UK for the UK. Sir, excuse me. Sir, 
my other query with my related with my first question. Under what law the suspect is arrested uh, if it is in, it is involved in money laundering cases? It is a kind of treaty between the governments, or it is under a special law uh, enacted by the UK government? No, so money laundering, if it's a conspiracy matter. In a money laundering, for example, it was a conspiracy, so he will be arrested under, under the conspiracy. But poker matter, for example, if, as you're talking about, all the money laundering uh, cases, that's under POCA. It's a start from three, section 329 and onward, and the, there is a sentence in section 334. And the maximum sentence for any, any money laundering offense is about 14 years. So, so con under the conspiracy, he can be arrested. That would be charged with the, the, uh, section 329 to 333, depending on the circumstances, the offense he committed. Receive this question. Uh, what, uh, what, man, what nature of cases actually Pakistani communities are generally found to face in uh, the United Kingdom? Uh, it's a good one. I'll touch the, all the communities now because I have a brief uh, on that. At the most of, I have, uh, because I've been in a criminal practice for the last uh, uh, about 11 years uh, in the UK. Uh, if you're talking about uh, our Peshawar site, the Jalem site, they're mostly involved in uh, uh, violent offense. Violent offense is like uh, murder, assaults, and the drug offenses. If you're talking about further coming to Lahore, it's about mixed ratio, not that much uh, serious offenses. If you're going to Faisalabad, Toba takes inside, uh, those over there is very domestic related, very little, little matters in the criminal side of practice. But when you're crossing the border over to India, uh, if from Indian Punjab, you'll see the violent crime, uh, kidnapping as well. And if you go to the Indian Gujarat, you will not see any violent crime, you will not see any drug offences, but you will, you will see is the money matters. Whether it's the fraud, whether it's uh, fake Viagra, whether it's uh, VAT fraud, but they all do with the money. They don't commit any other crime except money. And when, when I'm talking about the money, big monies. And when you cross over to uh, Sri Lanka, they commit uh, uh, most of the fraud matter, which is the credit card frauds. Uh, when you go to Africa, African countries, especially in Nigeria, they do the fraud matters or some drug matters. And uh, Ghana, they do uh, most of the crimes uh, that's accounts related. It's money related, it's account related. Polish people, they commit the violent crimes because they drink a lot. And the Romanian people, they are the thief. So they do, do pickpocketing, pick and uh, even though ATM cash machines, we call it a Lebanese loop. They take your card, they you take your credit card details or the bank card details and take the money out, out, of, out from there. So these kind of offenses from different Countries they, they commit to different roles. A, a very uh, unpol uh, unpolitically correct actually answer. Uh, you, you do you, you do believe actually that uh, in criminology uh, the origin uh, ethnic origin of a particular person also determines the nature of a uh, crime. Uh, no, I'm not I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. Okay. But yeah. this is the the people that are coming from those countries. I'm not blaming the entire country. There are decent people everywhere. So that's not the case, well, but this is the majority of the case. As the question was put to me, so I just and described all of it. I appreciate that. Uh, one question is actually, one fundamental failing in Pakistani criminal system, especially in the trial system, is actually the lack of witnesses. Witnesses do not come forward to actually prosecute. What is the magic thing that you have in the United Kingdom which allows uh, case trials yeah. to actually proceed and uh, people to get convicted? A very good question. Uh, Prosecution witnesses, especially, I think that's relevant to the prosecution. 
if a prosecution witness who has provided the statement to the police already and the statement has been submitted to the court and the defense as well and he says later on I don't want to come up to the court to give the evidence the court can issue the summons and the police if he still refuses to come the police can go and arrest the person and bring it to the court that's how the proceedings are being done. but there there is no witness protection in actually serious violent oh crime there is a lot there is a lot I can refer you to one of the cases um, I dealt with it was a robbery matter it was a um, crown court that dealing with the matter and uh, during the robbery he was my client was on the bail and he went on to the victim to sign a withdrawal statement he went on to submit the statement to the police in the next appearance the police produced the statement to the court and say that this gen this suspect actually went on to the victim and then put the knife on his neck and made him to sign the withdrawal statement and the court's taken the bail away i argued the bail but the court said no mr shafi you think we take we should take the bail away from your client once he killed the person actually so that's how they protect the witness. Okay. Uh, what is the effect of hostile witness with respect to trial? Yeah, it's hostile witness, uh, what you say is the person actually, when he's coming to the court and doesn't want to give the evidence, the question is being put to the person and he accepts something and then say, I don't want to give the evidence. That's, that's where the prosecution make the application there and then the witness is hostile. And if that's the case, the most likely the court accepts the version of the, the witness that he has given already in the, in the Section 9 statement or the little bit he confirms. That the sympathy goes with the prosecution, not with the defense. Are lawyers actually charged by the hour in the United Kingdom? How exactly are we? Yeah. In the, in the most of the process, uh, there's two sets of the fees that's going on in the UK. The majority is the per hour. At the VR, uh, and then some cases they are dealt on the fixed fee basis. And where the per hour is, that's where you need to uh, claim on the basis of the grade you are in. The highest grade for the lawyer in the UK is the grade A. Uh, I'm grade A now. And in central London, if you sitting in central London, and your rates will be four hundred twenty pound per hour plus VAT for grade A. And they, no, these are regulated. The amount of yes, this is approved by the Law Society. Okay, so the Bar Council basically fixes the amount that. Yeah. Has, uh, this is the maximum amount. If somebody claims more than that, and then they can uh, disallow that amount. Uh, that's you have claimed more than what the grade is. The reason the I would minimum amount is also described. Yes, minimum amount. There's a grade. There's a grade A, grade B, grade C, grade uh, and the grade B can claim two hundred sixty pound per hour in central London plus VAT. Uh, we, when we say the VAT, VAT is the tax, which is twenty percent in the UK. Here is I think maybe sixteen percent or something like that. And then uh, then the grade C. That's where I think 180 or something. Even for all civil cases and criminal. Yeah, yes. And then there is a traveling cost is different. Uh, and it's the time you're spending for the travel to the court or anywhere else. So that should also be claimed as per hour. But the rates for the traveling would be the 50% off from the actual rate, the preparation for the trial. Uh, the reason for my, me asking actually about the rates is if you compare the United Kingdom uh, legal system and especially the trial system, and the trial system in Pakistan, uh, one is functioning and one is not uh, properly. Uh, lawyers in Pakistan get paid once, more, uh, invariably, yet our cases go on for years and years. However, in the United Kingdom where there might be an interest to stretch out a particular case because you're being pay paid by an hour, your cases actually get decided earlier. What is the fundamental flaw? Uh, among uh, with the lawyers with the judges how exactly do we fix our system because you've had uh, the uh, and experience of both both the legal systems yeah you? it's very easy uh, for example uh, in the UK also the case goes for two years some cases they go for it it's not if the case go for two years and you cannot claim for the two years doing nothing file is sitting in your office if the paper is served about hundred pages and they have set the criteria you can claim maximum two minutes per page. 
to read it. Okay? And then, for example, you seeing the suspect amount, for example, on 100 pages, you seeing the suspect two times and you claim in two hours each time, it's justified. If you're going to claim you I have seen the suspect ten times for a hundred pages, they will disallow it. You say it's only hundred pages. Why are you seeing ten times? It means you are exaggerating and you making your bill a little bit you know, more no, no, higher. No, my, my question, exact, yeah, no. I'm coming back to you, I think. It's the same in, in the Pakistan as you say is. Uh, to my understanding, it can be fixed in a way. For example, the same as uh, we have in the UK, it's two minutes per page. All the paperwork relating to the matters you can claim as two minutes per page. And then, for example, attending the client and then the hearing. Hearing can be fixed per day in Pakistan because you have to wait from the morning till evening. Maximum amount can be fixed. If it's a full day, it's this full day amount, this should be the amount. And that can be fixed as well. And then another thing is, which is in Pakistan, which is Im very important uh, regarding the prosecution, mostly in, in relation to the, there are a lot, lot of fake cases being registered against, and that defense cost order should be granted. Hmm. Anybody who fails to prove the case, who, whatever the defense has paid the money to the lawyer, that should be recovered from the complainant side. By filing a separate suit? Uh, no, like, not filing separate suits. Once the case is over in the court, and then the defense should make the application there and then, uh, in this case, because my client has been acquitted now, and uh, may I ask for the defense cost order now? And the judge should grant the defense cost order in the same matter, and that subject to the taxation. You know, that should, they should make some body. It's a, it's a long debate, but I can give you the brief on it. But I think it's hard to conclude within no, no, this lecture because, now. No, because this is a, a part of the, there seems to be an uh, impression that uh, law, uh, getting justice in Pakistan is like, expensive, but compared to the United Kingdom, uh, I mean, uh, uh, once again, actually, I, I, I would put the question to you: Do you think actually getting justice in Pakistan is uh, expensive uh, as compared to to the United Kingdom? But uh, to my mind, the reason the system basically drags on, one, one point you pointed out was actually costs, that you would have to bear someone else's cost. No one actually gets prosecuted for a false FIR here. No one has to actually pay costs for dragging someone through the court for years and years. So um, what, what three remedies would you give to the Pakistani legal system by which you, you believe that if these are implemented, uh, one, you have already suggested that uh, maybe the Bar Council uh, needs to regulate the nature of uh, fees, uh, the maximum number, the nature of fees and the, the amount of time you put up, uh, put into a case and the, the fee we can charge for that as well. Uh, what other remedies would you suggest? Uh, I'll suggest to, to three. Also, also adding this question, are you satisfied about the handling of Pakistani people's case? Uh, yes, yes, I am come to that stage uh, in a minute. Uh, uh, I'll suggest about uh, uh, four things. Uh, uh, the one I have suggested already about the, uh, uh, the cost. Uh, and the second thing I will suggest is we need to uh, change the uh, practice of our police in terms of uh, bringing all the material in relation to the suspect. His previous history or everything, there should be some set of practice that every time he is being arrested, it should be recorded nationally, not only individual police station. In this country, now what's happened is, if somebody is arrested in Karachi, and then arrested in the UK, he might be on bail for a murder in Karachi, and arrested here, nobody knows he is on bail for murder in Karachi. And the judge cannot look into it, defense cannot look, to, look into it, and the defender actually has to go to Karachi, get the copy of the FIR, come back at love of hassle. That's where the prosecution cost as a lot of uh, there is a lot of cost involved for the defense as well number one number two in terms of the prosecution papers what we have in the uk is it's the responsibility of the prosecution to serve every single document to the defense here in the pakistan what the practice is the defendant has to pay the money in the court to get the copies of the case certified copy that should not be the practice that should be completely scrapped the judge should make an order, prosecution should serve everything on such and such date. The prosecution should provide full set of copies to the defense in order to get the defense prepared. 
The third thing, which I will say is, as I mentioned in my lecture earlier on, about the procedure, everything is dealt on the first hearing. Issue of the trial, witnesses requirements, and how many, how many days the trial will go for. That's the thing, the procedural stuff should be set and the changed uh, in order to speedy justice, I mean, in terms of the cost, in terms of the witnesses, if a person, for example, the trial is, has been fixed after one month and the prosecution is going to come on the, after one month, oh sorry, our witness is not coming, the court should order the witness summon and order the police to arrest the person, the witness to bring it to the court. If the prosecution is still unable to bring that forward and the trial is being adjourned again, and the judge should order a wasted cost order for the day against the prosecution. And same applies to the defense. If the case is being adjourned due to the defense, and wasted cost order for the day should be against the defense. Approximate quantum of that would be around? Uh, around it's depending on the fee structure here in Pakistan. I don't know what the fee structure is now, but whatever the per day cost would, should be, that should be the quantum fix rather than per hour rate. Per hour rate would be difficult to manage in Pakistan, I, I, I can understand it. It's better just for the day. Okay. And if on the next, next hearing, the somebody is going to make an application again, the case should be adjourned, the judge should not adjourn it. One hearing on, on unexpected uh, circumstances like somebody hospitalized, somebody died, not some excuses, he got the wedding, he has to go for the wedding. Uh, that's not an excuse. No, but uh, the, the discretion lies with the judge or the law does not allow for the adjournments. How? Because in Pakistan, regulating adjournments is almost uh, impossible. All cases, I mean, vakalat nama, vakalat nama, supersession, uh, delaying, uh, de uh, delaying tactics. The vakalat nama, as you say, is the, no, we say is the authority that, uh, from the client. Only one chance should be given to the client. On the next hearing, if he, if he doesn't bring the, uh, the lawyer, he should go for the trial without the lawyer. The lawyer is going to give the attorney, I mean the vakalat nama in the court, he should set the issues on the day, what's the issues in the trial, and the witness requirements and everything, if it's the magistrate court matter, if it's the session court matter, one date should be given to the defense lawyer to get the repair because the session court is the higher code and a lot of things involved. Mm -hmm. So no more than that. The procedure should be changed. It should be implemented by the judicial council, I think, if you want to speed up the justice in the UK, in Pakistan. Okay, any other questions, please? Sir, please. Ah, Your Majesty. Sir, my question, depending in two parts, first is date, first, first is that, sir. Uh, who is the uh, exact executive authority in the Great Britain for amending the law? Second, we are a member of the Commonwealth. Mega financial crime committed in the territorial jurisdiction of Pakistan and offenders physically appear and residing in the Great Britain, sir. If offense is being committed in Pakistan, that's the jurisdiction of Pakistan. Okay. If a person, I can give you the example, <coughs> offense is being committed in Pakistan, one person is present in, in the UK and one is in Pakistan and they plan together, then the jurisdiction of UK also applies, it comes to the fall under the conspiracy. If a person taken something from Pakistan and taken to UK, and that's the jurisdiction of UK as well lies there. Okay? And then, in, sorry, in amending the law, there's a two sets of things. One is the sentencing guideline, which is a new, over there in Pakistan. There is a committee that deals with the sentencing stuff. Is that, the binding? Older setting. Is that binding? Because if you can let us know. The sentencing guidelines, are those binding on the judges? Gee, it is binding on the judges. And I, I can give you the brief uh, on, on that because uh, I was uh, uh, shadowing a district judge uh, in, uh, in the UK. I was a part of the bench. Uh, and uh, it's a very good example for Pakistan and uh, in terms of political influence, all the stuff. Uh, if it's an ex-Lord uh, Chancellor, Lord Faulkner, he appeared before um, 
uh, as uh, 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 Westminster Court uh, in London for a driving offence. He had nine points already on his lessons. And uh, in the UK, if somebody goes to 12 points, uh, he can be disqualified from driving. Okay. And uh, it's uh, discretionary powers from the court. Uh, they can allow, still allow somebody to drive the car, even somebody have a 12 points. And he was doing 40 mile speed uh, on a speed limit where it was 30 on the road. And uh, the police officer booked him in. On the day when his case was listed in the court, he came. There is no public with him. There is no political figures with him. He's an ex-Lord Chancellor, which is equivalent to your ex-Chairman Senate. He was a sitting member of the Lord, uh, House of Lords, and he was the Chairman of the Housing Association, which is the portfolio like a Minister of Housing. And that's the portfolio he had at the time when he appeared before the court, only with one person, who that person was, his lawyer. When he appeared before the court, the clerk asked him, he introduced himself to the court, he pleaded guilty to the offence, and the sentence was given to him, the disqualification for six months and two thousand pound five hundred fine. Good. As we, as the judge, um, the, I was shadowing, passed the sentence, we retired from the chambers. Before reaching to the chambers, I held him. I said, uh, Michael, uh, I think we should have allowed him to drive the car. He said, No, Mr. Shafiq. He should not be thinking, though his words were, he should not be thinking he's superior than others when he go out. He's our role models. The sentencing guideline gave a leeway. He should have been allowed to drive the car. But his portfolio, he's a role, role model. And then he should follow the law more. So that's what position is. Coming back to your question about the scriptures. It was Mazar Mahmood who captured them. He was working for News of the World at the time. There was evidence, and the cricketers, they pleaded guilty, but we, we were not the trial lawyer for them. We don't know what kind of evidence was involved. All of us heard on the media. But the one thing is very uh, relevant uh, to your question. As soon as the News of the World closed down, and then he went on to join uh, Sunday Times, Mazar mm -hmm. Mahmood. The Sunday Times, he did, done the first task, he captured again a Pakistani solicitor who was running a practice in London for uh, arranging uh, uh, fake money to get the visa in the UK, uh, entrepreneurial visa. He captured him, giving the advice, uh, and then he went on to publish that article on the Sunday Times. And then he put the video clip online as well. So I was instructed for that matter from the day one. Mm. Then I dealt that case and we won the case in eight months time. And uh, we proved he was altering the evidence. Uh, Mr. Mazar Mahmood and our client was acquitted. And, uh, and after the fall of that, and the Mazar Mahmood now is being hammered by the footballers and all of this now. Yeah. He does out of the evidence, I agree with you where you was coming, because I saw in my case what I dealt soon after the correct test. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming over. Sir, it was an honor to receive you, sir. Uh, and thank you very much again. And I must also acknowledge actually our uh, ex-president, Chahan Sahib, actually for uh, coming to our function as well. Honor for us. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, sir, uh, sir uh, Sir, uh, please group photos are okay, sir, with our learned guest, please. Sorry, those two kids are not here. No, sir, please. 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 S